Thank you. Uh, thank we also thank you. start thank the recording now. Okay. Great. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you so much for the kind of introduction and uh, thanks for having me here. My name is Yan Ying and uh, I, um, oops, I, I am an assistant professor at Cornell University. So the bulk of my research have been focused on this new emerging field that we call science of science nowadays, which is basically to think about how do we use different approaches to better understand science itself as a complex system, thinking about questions such as how it evolves over time, and in many cases, we take a further step how it interacts with the broader society, including many of the socioeconomic systems that we may be interested in. This is a kind of research agenda that is only possible through a combination of different tools. First is many decades of social science literature about science and innovation from areas as diverse as history, philosophy, sociology, psychology, economics, information science, and so on and so forth. In parallel to this is our increasing ability to build mathematical models that are rooted in complex sciences. So here, by constructing general stochastic frameworks that mimic the behavior and decision-making processes of scientists and innovators, we hope to construct formal modeling grounds of success and impact in science and innovation. These theoretical frameworks are most powerful when combined with the recent opportunity of large-scale data sets that captures different aspects of science with an unprecedented scale and detail. So here I'm showing you a few data sets we have been using in our research, which as you can see, the really exciting point here is not only hundreds or millions of scientific papers, but also our increasing ability to link these scientific outputs to other important social economic institutions, right? And you can apply a range of data science or artificial intelligence tools to make sense of these large scale data sets. We are now able to map up the complex relationship and interactions both within and beyond science. So in my view, this not only helps us to better understand the evolution and the broad impact of new scientific knowledge, but also contributes to broader computational social science research by offering new analytical frameworks. And thanks to the availability of these data sets and tools, the community has witnessed tremendous advances in our ability to quantify and even predict the patterns of impact for science and technology, as many of the examples you can see from these slides. But at the same time, if we take a few more minutes and think about what we are really talking about in these slides, you will realize that our current understanding of science and innovation has disproportionately focused on the most successful ideas products, individuals, or organizations, which raises a big open question of how should we understand failure, this big elephant in the room. And this has been part of our research during the past few years. And what we have learned through this journey is that in many cases, if you take a very serious look into failures, it is not just simply the alternative outcome as opposed to successes. But in many ways, it can serve as a very useful and early stage signal for us to better understand success in science and technology. So through this talk, I'm going to draw on two examples, or one already published, and the other we are still trying to wrap up. Um, just to think about how can we combine these large scale data sets with social science theory and mathematical models to look at the dynamics of failure and take a further step, can we use the dynamics of failure to better understand the onset of success? Okay, so let's start with the first one, where we think about a very simple yet previously unknown question. We all know success is often preceded by repeated attempts that initially fail. You don't get to your success at your first attempt in many cases. But what exactly are the maximums governing the dynamics of failure? And this turns out to be a question that is much harder to answer when we really um, dive into it. Part of the reason is most existing data, such as papers, patterns, or products, always have a survivorship bias. You are looking at papers that already get published, patterns that already get approved, or products that already went viral. So we spent almost two years to collect three large scale data sets across science, business, and the radical social movements that have an unbiased coverage of both successful and failed attempts. First data set here, with our unique access to NIH grant application, we look at scientists who applied for their first grant did not get funded. 
applied again, failed again, until they have a new grant application funded by NIH, which is the largest pu public biomedical funding agency in the world. Second data, looking at similar processes, but for serial entrepreneurs involved with multiple startup companies. First startup, first few startup companies did not successfully exit until they try again and get a new venture that achieved IPO or high value merger and acquisitions, which is a common definition of success in the startup world. Third data set, going beyond traditional innovation domains, we look into repeated failure of clerics organizations launching attacks where success for these organizations can be approximated as a fatal attacks that has killed at least one person. So together, they cover a very different type of repeated failures. And what I'm trying to think about here is whether we can construct a mathematical model to think about these very basic, very fundamental rules about how exactly do we learn from our past failure to make our future attempt. And what we see here is that we can view each attempt as a combination of different components. For example, if you are writing a grant proposal, this requires your biosketch, budget, preliminary data, broader impact, and so on and so forth. And the key here is that as you fail repeatedly, you not only accumulate your past experience and materials, which may be reused in the future, but also you receive external evaluation telling you where you did well and where you need further improvement, right? So you can combine these two insights and construct a simple mathematical model. The key idea here is that if every time we do something again, we will review recent failure experiences and use external feedback to decide which are the parts I want to update or which are the parts I want to just reuse build on my past experiences. Updating a component is costly in time and provides more variance in my performance, while reusing an existing component saves time and keeps the original score. So this model mimics the exploration exploitation framework that many of you may have already been familiar with. But the key here is that we are interested in a parameter which we call k here, defined as the number of recent failures that are considered every time, telling us how much you learn from your past failures. So this k parameter gives us a way to capture different magnitudes of learning from failure experiences. Let me give you one extreme, which is k equals zero. Then no previous failure is taken into consideration. And what happens is that you don't really learn from your past failure. Every time you will have constant performance on average, and every time you will spend unit time submitting your next grant proposal. In this case, success happens purely driven by chance, relating to the literature, highlighting the role of luck or chance in science and innovation. This is what happens if you learn from nothing, k equals zero here. But you can think about the other extreme, which is k equals infinite where you learn from a growing pool of all previous failures. What happens here is that you will see a systematic learning behavior. So as you fail over and over again, you are failing increasingly better and faster every time. You not only have improvement in your performance, but also it's taking less and less time for you to finish your next attempt. If you plot TM, which is the inter-event time between your nth failure and the n plus one's failure as a function of m, which is your total failure experience here, you will see TM decreases systematically as a function of your past experience, following a power law relationship that is signature of learning curves. So this means if you learn from all your past failures, you actually learn very efficiently and you are fairly increasingly faster and better every time. But what's interesting here is that we are seeing two extremes presenting very different behaviors. But what about a more realistic case, which is between the two extremes? And here's a key finding of our model. Basically, it tells us that the eventual outcome of this learning processes represented on the y-axis follows not a gradual, but a highly discontinuous relationship of how much failure you learn from at each single step which is a parameter k on the x-axis. This discontinuity is captured by a tipping point k star here, representing the minimal number of recent experiences you may want to learn from if you want to succeed. So what happens here is that if you have a k parameter lower than the critical threshold k star, such as scientists only learning from their most recently rejected proposals, what we see here is a asymptotic behavior that is very similar to k equals zero, 
where both your efficiency and your performance will get stuck at an early saturation point. Even if you have some initial improvement, you will quickly hit a saturation point. So as in this regime, people throw away many past useful components altogether, so they are not learning from enough failures, as if they are not learning at all, similar to k equals zero. But once we look at more failures, increases k parameter, and make it going across the threshold k star, we quickly enter into a new regime of success and progression. Well, as we reuse previous experiences efficiently, people again initiate this pattern of entire improvement. They are not only failing increasingly better every time, but they are also failing increasingly faster every time, showing a similar pattern as k equals infinite, learning from all past failures, okay? So what's interesting here is that if you combine these two regimes together, we see a tipping point of what phase is called a phase transition. We have the transition between these two qualitative different regimes, stagnation and progression, happens very abruptly near this critical threshold K star. So on two sides of this critical point, we either stagnate, behaving as if we learn from nothing, or we progress, behaving as if we learning from everything. Just as the water at 31 degree and 33 degree, which have almost the same temperature, but one is solid, the other is fluid. Physics that tell you these are very different states. Similarly, now you can think about two equally promising and lucky scientists or entrepreneurs, which are in virtually all aspects very similar to each other. But depending on whether they have this K parameter just a little bit below or beyond this critical threshold K star, one may enjoy a widely successful career, while the other does not. What's really intriguing here is that on the one hand side, we are seeing this small variation in K can make huge differences on the eventual outcome, stagnation or progression. But at the same time, if you look at temporal dynamics here, our model predicts that the stagnation and the progression regimes are following fundamentally different efficiency and quality dynamics as people fail over and over again. And this turns out to be a prediction that we can directly test in our data. So let's, for example, get back to our NIH data. So now I'm going to look at two groups of people. Both of them have failed as their very initial grant applications. I'm going to look at this blue successful group, which are people who fail, 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 but eventually succeeded. I'm going to look at another group of people, which is orange unsuccessful group, which are people who also failed repeatedly, but unfortunately they gave up, drop out of the NIH grant application system without any a single success. So I'm going to focus on both groups, and I'm going to ask, what are their temporal dynamics look like? Here, temporal dynamics simply refers to the inter-event time between two consecutive grant applications. How long it takes you to get from your first proposal to second one, from second to third one, and so on and so forth. As we plot the empirical TN from our data, we see very interesting pattern. Where this blue group, those who eventually succeeded, they are failing faster and increasingly faster. If you look at the inter-event time Tn as a function of n here, it is decreasing systematically, approximately following this power law scaling, which looks like a straight line in a log-log scale. This temporal scaling is, however, absent for the orange unsuccessful group. Those who eventually drop out are submitting their proposals at an almost constant rate. And the behavior of these two curves are very consistent with our model predictions for the progression and stagnation groups, respectively. But what's even most impressive here is that if you look at these two groups, they follow fundamentally different temporal patterns that are distinguishable at an early stage. So what this means is that we are having, we are seeing an early temporal signal. Well, just by looking at the rate of your application, how fast does, do you submit your next grant application? We already have some useful signal to help us predict which are the people that are more likely to succeed in the future. So let me put it in another way. If we consider two people who both submitted 10 applications, so the first one eventually succeeded, the second one did not. 
The traditional wisdom will tell you maybe some really great idea happened as the very last attempt for the first person, but not for the second one. But what we are seeing here is that these two curves start to diverge as early as the second attempt, telling us that the difference between these two groups may happen even earlier than the very last attempt. You can distinguish these two groups at a very early stage. And this turns out to be the pattern that not only works for science, if you do exactly the same empirical test for startups or for terrorists, you see very similar patterns. But again, this highlights this idea of early signal of eventual success, where this outcome following a long sequence of repeated failures may be predicted as an early stage, pointing to the idea of tipping point, where even in the absence of distinguishing characteristics, we can still use these mathematical models to recover some quantitative patterns that help us understand who are the people that are more likely to get eventual victory or defeat following repeated failures. There are also a bunch of related measurements and robustness checks we have done here. For sake of time, I'm just going to skip it. But if you are interested, feel free to check out our paper and supplementary information, which is published on Nature in 2019. So in my view, this represents as a very initial step to demonstrate the possibility of looking at success using the trajectory failures. So dynamics of failure, in some cases, can tell you some useful information about who and who and when are they going to be successful following repeated failures. And next, I want to build on this idea and think about instead of isolated researchers, we work in the community, in a social environment. So what about the success and the failure of a research community? Can we also look at the success of a collective intelligence by looking into its dynamics of failures, right? So this brings a second project I want to talk about here, which is to think about a particular kind of collective success, which I call scientific and technological frontiers, or in other words, it's just a record-breaking science or record-breaking technology. This is a kind of idea that have attracted a substantial amount of attention, both within and beyond science, just showing you a very small number of related news headlines here. People talk about the smallest digital camera card yet. People talk about the biggest ever rockets that have been assembled in history, and so on and so forth. And here's a simple yet useful way to look at how these frontiers have evolved over time. If, let's say, we want to track the progress of superconductor research, we can just go back to history and see how the world record of highest possible critical temperature of superconducting materials has grown over time. You will see a lot of slow progress in the mid 20th century, followed by rapid improvement in the 1980s when a fundamental new class of materials have been discovered by scientists. Similarly, you can look at AI progress. This is what the AI community call benchmarking. Basically, the idea is that you have a standard task, you have a standard data set, you have standard measurement, and people proposing all kinds of algorithms, and you compare the performance of this algorithm. Those who get a good record is called a state of the art. And you see how the state of the art for a certain task have been changing over time. So this is for image recognition. We are seeing a lot of exciting progresses um, during the early 2010s, which is roughly the time of deep learning revolution. But it's also have been stagnated a bit in the next few years. So what's interesting here is that they give you some curve, some dynamics about the collective progress. And then my instinct when seeing these curves are asking, is there any pattern? Is there any predictability underlying these curves? But it turns out to be something that is highly non-trivial. Let's say if we are only given the first few data points for each of these curves, is it not obvious that how we will be able to accurately predict its future trajectory? If I do some simple extrapolation, it's very likely that I'm going to underestimate the progress for the left-hand side superconducting material case. And may, I may be too optimistic about the progress in image recognition, the right-hand side, right? So this illustrates the idea that we are dealing with a complex social system that appears very noisy and unpredictable. And this is nothing new. The idea of very unpredictable 
or punctuated in scientific and technological progresses can be dated back at least to Thomas Kuhn, where in his book, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, he talked about the idea that scientific development could be portrayed as a succession of tradition bounded periods punctuated by non cumulative breaks. Related to this, there have been this famous idea of punctuated equilibrium. It was first originated from evolutionary biology, but quickly penetrated different areas in social sciences as well as natural sciences. People have been talking about this idea of punctuated dynamics in organizational change, language evolution, both human language and programming language, um, policy change, business cycle, scientific and technological changes, and so on and so forth. If you look into literature, they seem to indicate high-level similarities across different domains. Although the exact measurement and result here may be subject of intense debates. So my take on this is part of the reason we are still in very intense, we are still intensively debating across this is partly because in for many of these domains, we don't have high resolution data. For example, in the very original evolutionary biology, you need to build out a lot of fossil records, which is very hard for you to get a very high temporal resolution. And what we can contribute here is to think about similar patterns in science and technology, where it is indeed possible to get very good high quality data. So in this project, we systematically collect and analyze six comprehensive databases tracing the dynamics of frontiers across six different domains of science and technology, from AI research to data science to theoretical computer science, basically solving NP-hard problems, to biological domains, and even to technology, the real well-building tasks. Within each of these domains, the data set traces a large variety of competitions as well as a complete set of solutions within each competition. And what's useful here is that for each competition, it ranks all solutions within it through a unified evaluation matrix, which allows us to track the progress of scientific and technological frontiers over time, classifying the entire set of solutions into those who establish new frontiers versus those who did not. So let me give you some example here. We are having six domains. For each domain, you are actually having hundreds or thousands of competitions. So for each domain, I'm just going to show you one curve from one competition. So you will see, again, these um, dynamics seem to follow what we call punctuated dynamics. You see both short periods of rapid improvement as well as long periods of stasis. So what's really happening underlying this long stasis is not people are being lazy. People are actually trying to propose a lot of solutions. It's just unfortunately, all of these new solutions are underperforming compared with the current state of the art. And how do we understand this? The real interesting about this data set is that now you can track not only those who are on the frontier, but also those who are in the envelope. You can look at all these black dots, each black dot representing one attempt people trying to propose a solution on an algorithm, but this effort does not lead to a new state or art. It does not lead to a new world record. And here again, the idea is to look into the dynamics of these black dots, these failures to see whether we can gain some further insights into the predictability or uncertainty of the success dynamics or this record dynamics. Okay, so how should we understand this? Before we really dive into the data, let me quickly talk about what we have already know or what have already been hypothesized about the dynamics of these curves. It turns out that if you review the literature about scientific and technological progresses, there have been two key elements that people keep repeating and highlighting over time, which is called chance and learning. And you can conceptualize each of these two elements through a simple model. So people have proposed this idea of fishing model of innovation, which is very prevalent in economics of innovation literature, which views innovation as a random search, which emphasizes randomness. Every time you draw a new random number from a fixed distribution, which is going to be the performance of your next attempt. In parallel to this, there is a cultural evolution that highlights the role of learning here. So cultural evolution people think, we don't start everything from scratch. In many cases, you build directly 
on the current state of the art. You stand on the shoulder of giants. So what this means is that the performance of your new solution is not something random. It should be based on the current state of art plus some random fluctuation term. So these two models give us very different aspects on the evolution of scientific and technological frontiers. For example, if we think about this very simple curve, on the x-axis, I'm going to measure how many different attempts, how many different submissions have been made in a competition by the entire crowd. On the y-axis, I'm going to count the number of frontiers, which is simply how many times the world record has been broken and re-established. We can build on this curve and measure a few different quantities. First the quantity that I'm interested in here is SM, which is simply the coordinate on the y-axis telling us how many record-breaking events have happened up to the nth submission here. In other words, this is the growth rate of the number of frontiers. Fishing model on the left-hand side will predict something that is very slow here because you are drawing random numbers. So it would be increasingly harder for you to build new frontiers as you quickly fish out of the low-hanging fruits. Fishing model predicts a logarithm growth which is pretty slow here. On the other hand side, if you look at the cultural evolution model, it will predict a very rapid progression following a linear function because every time you have a constant probability to build a new frontier, this is a Poissonian dynamics. So fishing model, slow progression, cultural evolution model, rapid progression. You can also look out into other quantities. For example, we can look at the waiting time until the next frontier telling me how long do I need to wait until the next record-breaking event happens. Again, we can go back to these two models and look at these model predictions. Fishing model predicts a long stasis with high uncertainty. So if you measure how long do you need to wait until the next breakthrough happens, fishing model tells you that it's going to follow a power law distribution with exponent minus two. For those of you who are not familiar with power law distribution, exponent of minus two means that theoretically, the expected time for you to get until the next frontier will explode to infinite, telling us that it is not unreal for you to see extremely long stasis before breakthrough happens. But again, this is not the kind of prediction you would make if you believe in cultural evolution. Cultural evolution, again, tells you there's going to be Poissonian dynamics. It's very frequent for you to have new improvements. And therefore, the waiting time until the next breakthrough will follow an exponential distribution with a very light tail. Together, through these two simple measurements, we can already distinguish between these two models. Fishing model, predicts a process with very slow progression, long stasis. Cultural evolution model telling you should expect something with very slow progression and short stasis, a lot of certainty here. Which one is true? We don't know until we see the data. So we repeat these empirical measurements in our data set, looking at the growth rate of frontiers as well as the waiting time distribution between different frontiers. And turns out that what we are seeing here is an intriguing exist coexistence between rapid progression and long stasis. So let me be a bit more specific of what I'm talking about here. If you look at the first row here, we are seeing each of the five data sets are showing a dynamics that is systematically faster than the logarithm expectation here, telling us that cultural evolution model is more correct in predicting the growth rate of new frontiers. But if you look at second row here, we find the waiting time distribution across all five data sets are actually following a fat tail distribution, which can be well approximated by a power law tail. So what this means is that if you look at the waiting time distribution, it rejects the cultural evolution model, but lends more support to the first fishing model. Combining these two models together, what we are seeing from the empirical data is that each of the two baseline models has got something correct, but not everything correct at the same time. So this raises a bunch of interesting questions. First is that what kind of model can explain these patterns? 
Can we generate a simple model that would predict rapid progression and lung stasis at the same time? Okay. And the other thing I also want to remark mark here is that thinking about these five different data sets, they are all about science and technology, but they come from different, different areas of science and technology. So there are different populations involved. They are about different tasks. They operate at very different time scales. But again, you are seeing the empirical patterns across these five data sets appear very consistent with each other, which means that going beyond a lot of case-by-case -case dependencies, there may be something fundamental and generic about the mechanisms of record-breaking dynamics. So this raises another question we also want to think about here, which is why across such diverse domains do similar patterns emerge? It turns out that a simple model, which can be adapted from the model we talk about in the first part, can actually explain the dynamics of both rapid progression as well as lung stasis. So here again, we build on the literature thinking about exploration versus exploitation or incremental versus radical search. And the key idea is to model innovation as a multi-level processes. So you know that changes or improvements can happen at different levels. So this has been a very famous paradigm. People look dichotomy, people look across different lines of literature under different names, incremental research versus radical research, local search versus global search, exploitation versus exploration, tweak versus leap, sustaining technology versus disruptive technology, component innovation versus architecture innovation, normal science versus paradigm shift, and so on and so forth. They may differ in some details and specific definition, but the key idea here is that you want to think about innovation processes happening at different levels. So here again, I'm going to think about innovation as a combination of different components, okay? But what's useful here is to think about different strategies you can do to make this innovation better. One strategy is incremental innovation, where every time, I'm going to only change one component. I'm going to start with the first component, keep drawing random versions, random alternative versions of the first component until I see a better version of component one that helps me improve the current state of the art. Then I shift my attention to the second component, keeping everything else the same and keep drawing different random versions for the second component. I may repeat this process for multiple rounds until I see something that makes my component two better. Afterwards, I'm going to shift my attention to component number three and so on and so forth. So this is what we call incremental innovation. Every time you just change one component while keeping all other components as the same. But this is not the only possible way you can do innovations. We can also think about radical innovation, which basically changes a very different idea at a very high level. So the way to operationalize is say, okay, I'm not going to change one component anymore. Every, if I'm doing radical innovation this round, I'm going to draw an entire different set. I'm going to draw new random versions for all components I'm considering here. Right? So this is what we mean by radical innovation. But we know in the real world, it is very rare for you to see people 100% of the efforts using incremental or radical innovations. So this allows us to introduce a parameter, which is PI here, representing the probability of incremental innovations. If your PI equals zero, meaning 100% of your innovations are radical innovations. If PI equals one, meaning 100% of your innovations are incremental innovations. But what we are mostly interested in is the middle field here. What if I have some incremental innovations and some radical innovations, which is represented as someone that's a pink visualization here. What we find from both model simulation as well as analytical solutions here is that once you combine incremental innovation and radical innovation, we will see the coexistence between rapid progression and long stasis. And here's intuitively why is that? Because you have some part of your research using incremental innovation, you can now explore different research directions or different components sequentially. This allows you to do rapid progression on new frontiers. You are breaking the records 
as a pace that is much faster than the logarithm prediction of the chance model or fishing model. But at the same time, how do you make progresses? At the end of the day, you are still drawing random versions until you see something is better. You either draw this random version as a one component level or as an entire innovation level. So there will still be a high uncertainty in future record breaking because you are still relying on luck in many ways. So this predicts the inter event time or waiting time distribution until next break record breaking time will again follow this power of distribution with exponent in many cases is around minus two here. So once you have these two elements, incremental and radical innovations, you will soon see this coexistence between rapid progression and the long stasis, which is something that is not expected by either of our baseline models, but is something that we see universally across our different data sets. And this brings to the other question, which is why are we seeing these very different patterns across the data sets? So one interesting observation we are seeing here is that as long as you have this parameter PI fraction of incremental innovation somewhere between zero and one, you will always expect the qualitatively similar predictions because the leading term from incremental and radical innovation will give you the coexistence. So it doesn't really matter which exact value are you taking here, whether you have 20% or 80% of your incremental innovation, it will lead you to the same first order behavior that is coexistence between long stasis and rapid progression. So this also gives us a possible explanation of why we are seeing this universality across different systems. These so different systems may differ in their specific PI, but as long as you have your incremental innovation and radical innovation mixed to any probability between zero and one, you will see the same qualitative predictions. What's very interesting about this model is that now we have solved this empirical puzzle. We can also use this model to make additional predictions, which allow us to better understand the empirical system, but also enable us to further interrogate our model. For example, we have been looking at WN here, which is a waiting time distribution, telling me how long do I need to wait until my next breakthrough. But you can also look at QN, which is how long I have been waiting. So this is time elapsed since my last breakthrough, last frontier here. One intriguing prediction made by our model here is that you will have a correlation between QN and WN. This is not expected by existing models. So both on baseline models, the fishing model and the cultural evolution model will tell you that we are, talk we are dealing with a memories process. There will be a lack of temporal, or temporal correlation. What this means is that whether I have broken a record yesterday should not predict whether I will be breaking a record tomorrow based on the fishing model or based on the cultural evolution model. Our existing models wouldn't expect such a temporal correlation. But our new model actually predicts there will be a positive correlation between how long you have been waiting here and how long you will be waiting in the future. The idea here is that if I have been stuck here for a long time, Probably this means I'm dealing with a component or an innovation that is very hard to improve. And the fact that I'm dealing with something that's hard to improve will also give you a signal that it may, it may take even longer for you to improve in the future. So this is what I call short-term predictability. And when we test this pattern in our data, again, we are seeing across all five data sets, although they vary in their magnitude, you are indeed seeing this temporal correlation between QN and WN on the very last row here. So basically it's telling you that recent progresses or recent breakthroughs predicts future breakthroughs. Or an already long stasis predicts even longer stasis in the future. And this is a kind of insight you can see in empirical data. This is a kind of insight that you wouldn't expect from existing model, but we can see from our current model. So to quickly sum up here, in this study, we see we look at the record-breaking dynamics by through, through looking at six large-scale data sets. What we are seeing here is an empirical puzzle 
which is a coexistence between rapid progression and the long stasis can't really be explained by existing models, but we have now a new model, which I call sequential problem solving model, which is a simple interpretation between incremental innovations and radical innovations. You build on the state of art for each component in incremental innovations. That's why you have rapid progression. Yet at each level of innovation, you will have uncertainty in random search, which predicts long stasis. So if I have to sum up the empirical patterns we found in this study, there are actually famous codes that does a great job. There are decades that nothing happens, and there are weeks that decades happen. And through this study, I want to again illustrate this idea that underlying these seemingly noisy and unpredictable social systems, there may be quantifiable regularity once we combine large-scale data sets with complex system modeling tools. And this, in my view, still represents a very initial step towards our understanding of collective success and collective failure. This is an oversimplified model, which ignores many useful components that you may want to incorporate in, in a more comprehensive framework. For example, you can think about network structure and new information sharing. Recent research has shown that, on the one hand side, you don't want isolated researchers. You want people to talk to each other, right? But at the same time, you don't want an overly dense, connect, densely connected communication network because it will lead to groupthink. People are not really proposing innovative ideas. So what would be an optimal network structure that accelerates innovation and record breaking? Or you can think about reward structures to incentivize resource allocation on different components. It has been well documented that if you have open information sharing, on the one hand side, this makes incremental changes in some easy components easier. But at the same time, people will be associated with a lower incentive to work on these very hard components of fundamental changes as an entire innovation scale. So this also raises the question, how do we engineer a reward structure that will accelerate not only these minor incremental changes, but also these big leaps? fundamental changes in scientific and technological progresses. So these are questions that we are still looking into and we are very happy to talk more if you are interested in. So let me finish by saying that thank you for your attention. Um, and we at Cornell Information Science have been hiring PhD students or postdocs, PhD scholars. If you are interested in joining us or some collaboration opportunities, feel free to email me and I am happy to talk more. And that's all I want to bring to you today. Happy to take more questions.